Welcome to All Set for Sunday podcast, your favorite podcast. Yeah. On your iTunes. For busy and distracted Catholics. Catholics. To be a little more prepared for Sunday Mass. That's right. Like and subscribe. We dominate that category. <laughs> Me too. My name is Scott Williams. My co-host is Jeff Trailer. What's up, bud? Hey, Scott. Um, Father Patrick Hyde is joining us today from Bloomington, Indiana. Sunny and beautiful Bloomington, Indiana. The Sock Father. It is a great day in Bloomington, but an even better day whenever I'm with the two of you. So thanks for having me. Oh, what a, that's what a, so sweet. Yeah, you're so sweet and full of it, but we like you for both of those. I reasons. am full of it. I'm not sweet. So <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, what's new out there? Kids are back. You're you're on that. Students are back. Uh, yeah. Um, just a lot of really good things at the beginning of the school year. It's been a really blessed beginning of the school year. Um, there's just been, not only have we had great attendance at so many of our events, there's just this wonderful spirit of joy and excitement that um, I've not experienced. Now, I will say that I may be a little partisan here because this is the first year we've had a full-time director of campus ministry here. So hey. for the first time in my eight years here, I'm not actually running all of these events. I can just show up and, and be a spiritual father. And so it's, uh, That's so maybe great. just the fact that I don't have responsibilities is the, is the spirit of joy that, <laughs> that I'm experiencing. Let it be clear. You, there's no way you don't have responsibilities you, but you may have less now and that's great. <laughs> Well, I have myriad responsibilities, but very few of them are running events. And so it's very different, as we all know, than when you, especially you guys, having worked in ministry, there's a big difference when you can just show up and be a part of an event versus having to be the one responsible for running an event. Amen. That's great. I was commenting before we got on here that you have just seemed filled with joy at the beginning of the school year and that you just hit the nail on the head on why. It's because... <laughs> You have a full-time campus minister, and that's yeah. awesome. There we go. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, let's talk about death. Let us talk yeah. about death. Let that's, us. Let us. That's kind of the uh, the theme, at least on the first reading. Yeah, sort of. All right. That's what I got. So out two-minute drill? Yeah, two-minute drill. Let's do it. Two-minute drill. Uh, 24 Sunday in Ordinary Time. Tell you what, last week was some great readings, and then we just brought it back again this week. Like we're getting we're getting hit hard here, and it's pretty awesome. Um, right off the bat, we in the book of Sirach, our first reading from the book of Sirach, we get wrath and anger are hateful things, yet the sinner hugs them tight. That one hit a little close to home. I don't always uh, I don't know that I carry around a lot of wrath, but like I struggle with anger a little bit sometimes, and I was like. Mm. Anyway, the whole idea that I'm the sinner hugging them tight, that one that took me off my feet a little bit. But mm. alas, the commandments are here. Uh, we have the commandments. Think of the commandments. Hate not your neighbor, uh, we're told. The responsorial psalm, I just wrote down two words, bang, bang, because this is a banger. Um, Maybe the banger to end baby. all banger. Are you going to do your version of the... <laughs> bang. You said bang, bang. I said yeah. on the door, baby. Yes. On the psalm, baby. On the psalm, baby. Yes. <laughs> Knock a little louder, sugar. Um, the everybody's probably on the seat, of the, like edge of their seat now. Well, what is it? Yeah. The Lord is kind and merciful. I, I was asking the slow same to question. anger, enriching compassion. I'm excited for it this week. We get a lot of. This is going to be a great one. I want to hear. I want to hear from everybody. Like, subscribe, ring that bell, but also uh, share some comments. Share it with us, like. Just how passionate your music ministers get into mm. the response to psalm this weekend. Our second reading, uh, we get a nice short reading. I'm like sometimes when we're preparing for the podcast, I get a little excited when we get a nice little shorty here. From no man, does it hit hard? Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, for the second reading, he says, "If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord." So what does that mean? Whether we live or die, it's for the Lord. Um, just nice, simple, hit you in the face, just exactly how Paul likes it uh, when especially speaking to the Romans. It, it's a real gift. And then we have our gospel reading. Our gospel is Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Peter approached Jesus and asked him, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus answered, I say to you, not seven times, but 77 times. 
This is why the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who has decided to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the accounting, a debtor was brought before him who owed him a huge amount. Since he had no way of paying it back, his master ordered him to be sold, along with his wife, his children, and all his property, in payment of the debt. At that, the servant fell down, did him homage, and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back in full. Moved with compassion, the master of the servant let him go and forgave him the loan. When the servant had left, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a much smaller amount. He seized him and started to choke him, demanding, pay back what I owe you. Falling to his knees, his fellow servant begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he had the fellow servant put in prison until he paid back the debt. Now, when his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were deeply disturbed and they went to the master and reported the whole affair. His master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave your entire debt because you belonged, begged me. Should you not have pity on your fellow servant as I had pity on you? Then in anger, his master handed him over to the torturers until he should pay back the whole debt. So will my heavenly father do to you unless each of you forgives your brother from your heart. Ooh, that was awesome. Uh, can I tell you at the very beginning of that reading, uh, it, he said, Jesus answered, I say to you, and I like, I stuttered because I was like, did I miss a amen, amen? Oh. Like I was like thrown off to see, I say to you, not an amen, amen, I say to you. It's true. But anyway, just wanted to share that. Thank you. Uh, Father Patrick, is that, is that a new webcam you got behind you there? Security camera? No, that's a fan. Oh. It just turned and looked at us, right? Isn't it? <laughs> just so, you know, I got my door open, nice gentle breeze. It's just a beautiful day, and I'm just enjoying it all. Looks like See, a comically large uh, security camera. Yeah, you're just on the you're on a webcam or on a this this call here, the Zoom call with three fans now. Hey, yeah. look at that. Yeah, I'm hey. glad that we've been able to stay uh, stay deeply immersed in the Word of God with all of this. So as usual, that's what we're that's what the people tune in for. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, did you come on here thinking that's what we're going to do today? Stay deeply immersed. <laughs> we're busy and distracted Catholics who need a little more. Yeah. Let's get on we're going to talk about fans. Yeah, let's get back on track here, Father, please. <laughs> um, did Jeff get anything wrong in his analysis or? or well, you know, in the, the spirit of in the spirit of the gospel being really about extending mercy to those who uh, just just can't help themselves. I, Jeff, Jeff did a wonderful job. Oh, good job, Jeff. Well, thank you. Proud of yeah. You. Thank you for, if you could forgive me 539 times, I would appreciate it. You, I will, I will make every effort to do so. Thank you. Why 539? That's what seven times 77 is. I did the math while oh, okay. I was reading today. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Thanks. I've always wondered. It's one of those so, things every time I hear it, but I just went and did the I'm going to be a nerd. I'm going to be a nerd here. Um, <clears throat> In the Greek, the two words that are next to each other are 70 times and seven. So that could be rendered 77 or 70 multiplied by seven. So the Greek is ambiguous there. It's not a mathematical formula in the same way that we would Before, want it to be. You can, you can go ahead and I'll give you the 490 if you want. Okay, great. Great. Thank okay. you. What's the over under on this? Yeah. All right. What well, do you preach? One of the things. Well, you know, any number of things, Scott, we'll see where the spirit moves. But in, in the gospel, we have, as is very common in our translation, a very poor translation. So we hear that the first steward or the first servant has no way of paying back the debt. So um, a debtor who brought before him who owed him a huge amount. Okay, that's great. And the other debtor who comes before him also owes him a debt. And it's important for us to see what, what's the difference. In the Greek, the, the first servant <clears throat> owes 10,000 talents, which is 10,000 years wages. Oh, wow. Remember we, in, the, in, the par, in the parable of the talents, right? One gets three, one gets two, one gets one. or Right? So or 10, that's considered an exorbitant amount. He owes 10,000 talents. So he, he's basically like a big bank that has gone belly up. He owes hundreds of millions of dollars in today's, maybe billions of dollars in today's terms. Again, rescued the by the government. Yeah, exactly. You know, 
<laughs> We've gone political. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, that's what that's what the people that's what they really want is more politics in their life. Uh, but then the other guy, he owes a hundred denarii. So the guy who owes ten thousand, essentially years worth of wages, no way he could ever pay that back, is forgiven. A denarii is essentially what you would have been paid for a day's work. So the one guy, the guy who owes this guy, who was way in over his head, like insanely over his head, owes him a hundred days late wages, and he treats him with cruelty. Um, and it's just a reminder. The thing that really hit me in in my first reading through this is the line that he had no way of paying it back. And it's important for us, especially when we look at mercy and God's relationship to us. You and I, sinners that we are have no way of paying back to God what he gives to us. So mm-hmm. grand, so gracious, so glorious, gratuitous is his mercy and love for us. So we all go before God like the man with 10,000 talents worth of debt. We go before him with something utterly impossible to pay back. And yet, every time we go to the sacrament of confession, what does God do? He pays the debt for us. He That eternal sacrifice of Calvary is always being paid for us. And so I think it's important for us to recognize how we are both of those um, debtors. In that um, we are given mercy so that, if you look at it this way, right, we are forgiven, especially if we've committed mortal sin. We're committed something that is a damnable offense. We're forgiven that. Why? So that we can sow God's love in the world. So that that person who said something mean or nasty to us can be forgiven, can be loved. Because that person has done very little in comparison to the the sins, that, the, the wrong that we have done. So that's kind of my, my basic strain there. I'll, I'll start, the, uh, before I pass it back for a little conversation, an ex- uh, a story that I've this this gospel always reminds me of is when I was in seminary, part of your formation, you apply, you have to apply to be ordained a deacon and a priest. And in religious life, more often than not, once you're given solemn vows, if you're a clerical brother, you, it's almost like a pro forma thing to be passed on for uh, ordination. I, for, there was a whole, comedy of errors and injustices and confusion and, and misunderstandings and when i initially applied to be ordained a deacon i was denied ordination and it was painful it was confusing it was embarrassing i thought there was a lot of injustice um, and i went to my spiritual director and i explained the situation to him and i was expecting him because He had told me stories of how he had been railroaded in his own life as a priest. I was expecting him to think, or I was at the very least to to accord with me and say, oh, those terrible people, aren't they the worst? And after I told him the story, he looked at me, he smiled, and he says, you know, Brother Patrick, um, what you need to do for the next six months to a year. And I'm thinking, okay, what is it? How am I going to get back at these guys? And he looks at me and he says, you're going to have to pray for these guys every time you pray. Because in the Gospels, when Jesus says, not seven times, but 70 times seven, what's he saying to us is that in order for us to forgive, we must receive that grace from God and give it to people. We have to forgive repeatedly until we forgive them emotionally, spiritually, in every aspect. Because so often in our life, we say, well, I'm a Christian, I have to forgive, therefore you are forgiven. But then we move on without actually doing the healing, without actually coming back and recognizing that that mercy that we give puts us on the same level, restores us to equality and friendship, not just, I forgive you. And so I want to just encourage people who are listening and going to Mass this Sunday and to think of, who is is there someone in your life who has hurt you, who you've never truly forgiven from your heart or someone who you you've said you've forgiven, but you still don't like them or want to be any, you know, th- there's a difference. We, sometimes we, we can't restore relationships that are broken at the same time. We should still have charity towards all. So 
looking at our own lives and saying, okay, who are those people who have 10,000 years worth of debt against me? And how can I pray for them and lift them up so that like the, like the, uh, the owner here, I can offer that great gift to them. Is that kind of, is, is there finality in forgiveness when we go to confession? So like what, if, if I go between to, us and God, absolutely. So I, like I've heard of people before saying like they've had to go to confession several times for the same sin that they've already been forgiven for, but that's not a thing, right? I mean, well, I if they commit the sin again, they would have to, but. Or if upon or, reflection, they were not, they realized they were not truly sorry. Right. But if you, you are, and you do all the stuff. Yeah. If like you meet all of the conditions for receiving absolution, which are a sincere and contrary heart, firm purpose of amendment, and a auricular confession, saying the number and times of the, you, the number and kind of a sin, you are absolved if that's what your heart desires. Um, however, you may come, you, you may commit that sin again. Um, you may over time. This is one of the things you deal with with people who have a conversion after a long period away or after a deep sin is over time, as they draw closer to the Lord, they realize the depths and the full impact of sin. And so they want to confess, hey, I did these things 20, 30, 40 years ago. And that's in one way healthy to recognize the brokenness. But in confession, a lot of times I have to ask, well, where you, have you withheld this sin or or what? Well, no, it's just something that's on my, okay, great. Like that's why we we continue to ask God for help and he helps to show us when we're ready to see it, how truly bad that was. But now it's also, we, we, because we've been, re, because we've been converted and have had a, a new way of life. How do I turn that into something positive as opposed to some keeping it as something negative? Yeah. I also, also wonder like sometimes like, okay, God forgave us, but do we give ourselves an opportunity to forgive ourselves for what we've done? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oftentimes we're the last person to forgive. We we forgive everybody but ourselves. Right. All right. Sorry, that was a tangent, but no, it was I good. Love it. Uh I have two dumber versions, dumber questions. Not a, we're not even into dumb questions yet. Yeah, this is pre dumb dumb questions. Yeah. What what if I don't wanna? <laughs> like what if I like it's one thing to say to somebody, I forgive you. It's another like really to actually mean it and like forgive them so like how do i i know that that's what this gospel is about is about like you have this like i have that gift in reconciliation and in my relationship with god of being able to be forgiven but like sometimes that's just really hard like you don't want to go to confession my, you don't want to forgive somebody i don't want to forgive somebody oh, yeah. like so i guess that's i don't know if there's an answer to it but like i think it's a practical side of like how do I, how do I work towards that? How do I get over that? How do I get over myself in that scenario? Mm. Uh, if like, yeah. It, or I guess like, can I forgive a person without like, for like. Say to, to them. Think, no, like <laughs> what if I can say to them that I forgive them, but like, if I'm still hurt by the things that person did or the actions of that person, and I say, mm. I forgive you. I don't know that I actually mean that if like, I'm still feeling that hurt and I'm still feeling that pain. Does that make sense, father? Like, I don't know where that balance is. Is it, is it wrong of me to say to that person and offer them forgiveness and, or at least verbalize that forgiveness if I don't truly mean that, if I'm not mm -hmm. actually in my heart able to walk away from that thing? I don't know if any of that makes sense. But. It's a great question. It makes a lot of sense. And it's a very common thing. So we talk about, the the sin and the effects of sin so if for instance um you were to invite me over for dinner and um which has never happened by the way but if you were um and <laughs> you've never accepted Sorry. but i've absolutely invited you over. <laughs> that's true yeah you have invited me several times my father uh, for dinner. but let's say let's say you invite me over for dinner and I accept, I come to your house, and then as the next morning, you and your wife and your daughters, you're like, where is all of these, you know, where's our TV, where's our stereo, all, the, all that's gone. <laughs> and you, and I've stolen all of that from you, right? Okay. And good Christian that you are, you would say to me, hey, 
I forgive you for this, but it would be crazy. In fact, extremely imprudent for you the next day to invite me over for dinner again or to trust me in your house again, right? So the effects of sin are so that I have broken that sin, the action has broken the trust, the bond between us. And therefore we still have to rebuild that, but we can do that over time and you can still not trust me, but have forgiven. me. Does that make sense? Yes. That does. And so the goal, that's why we, we yeah. need to continually pray for the people who ask for our forgiveness because and continue to ask for that because we don't just want to pay lip service to this. We want to say to that person, not only do I forgive you, but I love you. In the Gospel of John, what is the first thing that Jesus says to the apostles in the upper room gathered on Easter Sunday? He says, peace, shalom. In Jewish parlance, when someone says shalom to another, that means we are equal. What does that mean? Ultimately, Jesus has paid the debt. They've abandoned him. They've rejected him. They have fled from him. He, they are hiding. They are afraid. And so what does Jesus do? He says, peace. That's the kind of, that's the kind of relationships Jesus desires for all of us to be able to go to those who have hurt us deeply and to say, peace, that takes time to get there. And mm -hmm. it requires continual forgiveness and prayer so that we can be remade and renewed through the Holy Spirit to love these people. Because I think here's the thing, the second reading, there's this great line, we are the Lord's. Sin is essentially a decision to live as something that you're not, right? It's the Satan in <clears throat> his rebellion so against sin? God. Sin is a decision to live as something that you're not, right? It's to choose to be something other than whose you are, which is God's. But when we choose something that's not God, we're choosing something contrary to who we are. Satan, in his rebellion, chooses to be like God, right? St. Michael, Michael, who is like God. He says, no, no, there's only one God. We are, we are, we are the Lord's. We are united to him. We are made in his, you know, the angels aren't, but we are made in his image. Mm -hmm. And so we have to remember that what is going to bring us reconciliation, what's going to bring us forgiveness is living in our identity, of coming to grips with the fact that, yeah, there are things in my life that are not of the Lord, but I am of the Lord. I am one with God. He has, he has through the graces of baptism and confirmation, made me one with himself so that I can live with him with that, so I can be with him and bring him to others. And so our goal here is to live everything as if we are drawing, you know, striving to be one with Christ Jesus, holding him as our example for everything that we do. And what is Jesus always doing? Humbling himself so that he can forgive, so that he can heal, so that he can bring about the conversion and renewal of all souls. This reminds me a lot of, and I'm hoping that you can fill in the gaps for me a little bit. Uh, someone explained once to me, like the true meaning of the sign of peace during mass is like, it's not a social hour for you to like say hello and chit chat with people around you, but it's an opportunity for you to offer peace. And kind of like what you said with that shalom, bit uh that we are one that we are that's a long bit <laughs> i didn't mean to your is, opener am i um am i close on that or is that he's googling real I, saw, fast. I, I saw no well i want to because i i want to be sure that i say this so in it, so I, i'm not 100 percent sure on this and i had yeah you because know, i wasn't expecting this to come up but in the liturgy, when I uh, have served a Dominican Rite Mass, um, in the old liturgy, the the there's a little thing that sits on the altar, and it's called I think it's called the pox, uh, peace in Latin. And the idea is that when the priest says the peace of the Lord be with you always and with your spirit, but that that the peace is flowing from what the altar. It's flowing from the eternal sacrifice of Christ made present through the Eucharistic sacrifice, right? So the peace that we are offering each other is not, hey, Bob, isn't it great to see you? Aren't we the best of friends? The peace that we're offering each other at Mass is the peace that flows from Christ Jesus, sacrifice, new, re represented his sacrifice on the altar. And so that's why the sign of peace is when it is within the liturgy because Christ had the representation of the sacrifice of Calvary has happened and therefore true peace can flow out. So when we do the sign of peace at mass, which just a reminder to everyone is always an option, 
But when we do that, that's a, it's a, I think we miss it a lot of times because it's become like, aren't we this great, happy, big, wonderful community? And that's true. And we should strive for that. But in that liturgical act, we are receiving true peace, which flows from God incarnate, made present to us in the Eucharist, so that we can become one with him and offer that peace to the others in our life. Okay. I don't know if that was too much or... Did you say yeah. it was like an instrument, like something on the Pax is 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 a thing on the altar in that, right? It's a physical thing, you said. Well, when I, I, I just remember, then maybe I am misremembering this, but um, when I was serving a Dominican Rite Mass one time as a, a high mass, there was a little um, um, object a piece on of the altar it was, if I recall correctly, it was an image of uh, our Lord or something along those okay. lines. And then um, the priest kissed it. And then it was, I was celebrating, I was, I was part of a mass for a group of nuns. And then it was offered to all of the nuns to kiss. Interesting. I think it was just called the pox. So again, like that's my, that was 10 plus years ago that, that, that I can remember that happening. But it's just it's, it's it was a beautiful image within the holy mass of how the peace flows from the altar to the world and this is why the the sign of peace at mass should not be this elaborate thing because our focus needs to remain wholeheartedly on the eucharist mm -hmm. and this is a way in which we share that eucharistic love with the people around us but we don't we shouldn't stop the uh the mass in order for that to go because now it becomes something it becomes a social thing as opposed to a christological reality yeah i guess the, what i was remembering is that that's the opportunity for us to truly become the body of christ unified once again and and when we say peace to one another that you know that's not just a social gesture it's a true moment for us to say that we uh like we have peace, got Christ peace in our, in our lives and peace with one another. Uh, and obviously there's lots of people in the church, but I immediately think of my family and those that are around me. And that if there are struggles or divisions to try to remove those from my heart at that time, as we enter into that, you know, Eucharistic moment. But I also hear that other side where it's Christ peace coming into, yeah. into our hearts. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's, an opportunity for the both and, or if it's mostly just the one you said. But. Well, I, I mean, this is my theological opinion <laughs> is that we don't want to take away like the, the true peace, the true unity that we have and that we talk about in the body of Christ is made possible through the literal body of Christ in the Eucharist. Right. So the peace that you desire in your household flows from your full active participation of Jesus in the Eucharist at Mass, right? And so when you just interject that into it, you, you could take, it, it's kind of like in the middle, it's like adding, um, it's adding, you know, it's, it, it can take our focus, the, the thing that's going to make your family more peaceful, at least from a theological and sacramental perspective, is not your ability to give each other a hug at Mass. That's, a, that's not a bad thing, but it's your conformity to Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so the Eucharist leads to that. And so if we take it away, if we, if we throw that into the middle of a mass um, and we're not clear on why we're doing that, it can very easily become something that makes us think that, and I've, I've had this encounter where people will say that, the, and this was happening, especially during COVID when the sign of peace, they asked us not to have it right after we re we re uh, resume masses. People are saying, "Well, you know, I miss this," or and that's okay. Like, yeah, you cer certainly miss it, but you're actually not. You're you're receiving all the graces and all of that, and you're actually you're you know um, maybe it's helped. The Lord is purifying. If your priorities were going to mass to say hi to your sister, your 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 brothers and sisters in Christ, maybe it's we need to reestablish the hierarchy of goods as to why we go to mass. That's what the narthex is for. Come on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. But, but now we've really gone off into a different direction. And I love that. I love liturgical 
sacramental theology. Yeah, you, know so. you do. It's fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. Well, do we go to dumb? Yeah, let's do dumb questions now. Yeah. What do you, what do you okay. think? Well, I had my other question, but I'm scared to ask it. At this oh. point. We we went way off the rails after that first one. So, I mean, it, it tied in somewhat. No, it did. No, it was good. I mean, it was great. This is what this podcast is. Off the rails is our middle name. Yeah. All set for off the rails Sunday. Yeah. Um, off the rails with Scott and Jeff. That should be the new. Uh... <laughs> That's a different. That, that should be that should be like the after podcast. That's you know, the like, oh, they have like the X, the X, the X, There you go. <laughs> uh. That's what didn't make it into this weekend's uh, podcast? And that would be fun. That would be fun, actually. I'd come on every week for that. Ooh. We'll get the whole group on. Um, yeah. Just schedule 20 minutes. Every, everybody get on. <laughs> what are you mm-hmm. on? Um, no, the other thing I was going to say is like, that. my other question, but you kind of, you really covered it well when, with my, like, I'm stubborn and I don't want to forgive people. What does that mean? But like the, the practicality for a parent of like, how do I, how do I get this across to my kid? Like my girls are older, but I still sometimes have to be like, stop screaming at like, no, forgive each other. You guys need to get along. We need to get along. What, like, how do we communicate the same idea from the gospel to a child who doesn't want to forgive somebody or who is acting with anger and wrath? Well, it's a great, because forgiveness is not changing the other person. So often, um, we think that if I forgive you, you're going to have to change. But also forgiveness is loving the person, even in their defects, right? So I don't know your daughters all that well, but I've met them. I've, I've been with them enough to know that they have very different personalities, right? So yes. forgiveness of one of your daughters to another is recognizing that, you know, she's always going to react this way because that's, or she's going to re- react this way because that's just her nature. That's, that's, that's her character. Um, and I'm going to love her in that, right? If, you know, I, when I, um, growing up, my, my parents loved to, to host party, not huge parties, but they love to have people over. They love to host. And I know on those days that my mom is going to be very, uh, demanding and she's going to be, you know, she's, you know, she wants to have a perfect party. She wants to have a, a beautiful home. Okay. Well, maybe the first time, if she says something to me, that's a little sharp, okay. I have to forgive her for that. But I'm being honest with like, that's just, that's, she's not being mean. She's not trying to hurt. It's just, that's a part of who she is. And so learning to forgive is actually learning to love her in the reality of who she is. And so part of, especially loving the people who are closest to us and forgiving them is repeatedly forgiving them for the same shortcoming, knowing that you're going to have to forgive them again, because that's who they are and, and loving them for that. Loving how that part of who they are calls you to something higher. That's good. All right. Now I'm ready for dumb questions. I don't know if that's very helpful for a 12 year old. But... That's actually very helpful. Yeah. I don't know if, I don't know if Scott's kids will understand the same explanation, but I think that's really good for my kids. <laughs> Probably not. I mean, one day. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, all right. Dumb questions. Uh, my first one that I have to ask that just in the middle of this podcast that I had to write this down. Is there a gallon of syrup on the floor behind your desk? I ask the same question. <laughs> is that a gallon of syrup? <laughs> it is not syrup. Sweet outside, right, right outside of my office. I have a sliding glass door just so that you can't see it right there, but there's a big sliding glass door right outside of there. There's a little fountain. And that's algicide that I use to keep the fountain free and clear of algae. <laughs> that is, that's good. Okay, great. But that uh, would be a tremendous amount of syrup. Well, I would. I was waiting for you to be like, yeah, actually, we made syrup before the uh, football game on Friday. Or we made uh, pancakes before the football game on Friday for 7,000 people. And- I was thinking like snow cone syrup. Oh, you were thinking snow cones. Oh, yeah, that was, yeah, it's blue. So that would be. But I was always a lime snow cone guy. Really? Hot yeah. take. Yeah. Really? I'm a tiger's blood guy myself. Mm. I think it's just all the reds mixed together, yeah. but whatever. Uh, all right. Second question. Scott, what was your favorite? Scott, what was your favorite snow cone flavor? Uh, pur- uh, purple. Purple. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Any type of purple grapey type thing. Okay. Um. Second dumb question. Uh, who is Blessed Giovanni Licio? 
Michio, he lived to be almost every 110. Time, every time you speak on this podcast, on the top of the screen, it says, Blessed Giovanni Licio is talking. <laughs> so a habit, a pious habit that I have taken up is every time I get a new phone, which is not very often. Uh, I think this is my second phone ever. Uh, I name it after a a, a random, uh, not random, but an obscure Dominican saint or blessed and blessed Don, John Lici in English, Giovanni Licio in Italian was a, I believe, 16th century, 15th or 16th century Dominican priest in Palermo, Sicily, who lived to be 111 years old. He was a Dominican for almost 90 years or, or 90 plus years. He lived a very austere life. He was renowned for his asceticism and his love of the Lord. So, so you named your phone after him? That's awesome. I named my phone after him. Specifically because if, if someone ever asks or sees like my phone pop up on something, they have we have this conversation. and We, we can talk about how we're all called to sanctity and Look at you with your, and, your sneaky evangelization. Do you just go into any yeah. like crowded place and airdrop something to just air? Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, I, I, I'm going to be totally honest with you. I don't know how that works, and I have. I'm also a bit of a conspiracy theorist, so uh, my airdrop is off all the time. <laughs> Got it. You keep your airdrop with your foil hat. All right. Yep. <laughs> uh, all right. Don't question. This is off of our other our conversation we had. The sign of peace. You've probably <laughs> seen some wild things during the sign of peace. Uh, I would assume that this is probably not. I'm not trying to like get people in trouble, and I would, but like I have recollection of times where the priest will wander just like off the altar to give people the sign of peace. Like, what was he doing on the altar? Off out of the sanctuary okay. to offer people to sign a piece what i always it, ask questions when people are on the altar i think that's a little i know you too do. far i get it can we move on to yeah. my question mm -hmm. <laughs> of what wouldn't be a dumb question about why somebody's on the altar but uh yeah what is that okay are you allowed to do that are you supposed to do that just wander around and give people a sign of peace um i'm gonna it's i'm gonna give you a little bit longer of a response the answer is no you shouldn't you? do that but Yes, I'm going to give you a I'm going to give you a long-winded response to a yes/no question. Um, In the original Aramaic, the sign of peace. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, one of the things that you have that I've, especially uh, those who went through the liturgical renewal after the Second Vatican Council, and those who were priests before and after, and or who became who came of age shortly after. I think it's important for us to try to try to understand the pastoral motivation for those things. Yes. And it's very easy. And I fell into this for a long time in my life to say, well, father, so-and-so does this thing, which is explicitly forbidden. Therefore he's a bad priest or a bad person, um, which is simply cruel, wicked, and not charitable. And so it's important for us to be, okay, well, what would motivate some a priest to do that? And in one way, that oh, they're trying to break down the barriers between priests and laity. They're trying to show that we're one community. And those are, in and of themselves, good things. But one of the things that I think we've, we're seeing in the church now, especially among our younger people, and I say this even though I'm not that old, but I, look, I see it among our college students, this reverence for a more, in a way, set-apart style of liturgical prayer is in a way, a response to that of when we do pray liturgically, it is the most important prayer that we have. And it's something different than every other gathering or prayer that we have. And so when we have things that we do within the liturgy that are either not in not what the church intends or, or um, an exaggeration therein, we end up saying that my we, we can inadvertently say my desires or this community's desires are more are are more important uh than anything else and so there's there's a fine balance that we have to strike there and, and so a question i always ask myself like when we at saint paul catholic center we used to have a tradition of everybody washing everybody's feet during the holy thursday mass the rubrics of the church indicate that it's just the priest watching the feet of 12 faithful. And 
one of the conversations we had was, yes, this is a beautiful gesture of people being able to wash each other's feet, but it actually destroys the gesture of the humiliation and the condescension of Christ. That here's, you know, in, in a way throughout the liturgical year, the priest is, exa is exalted and here's his opportunity to come and humble himself in simple act of, of service to the community. And so we then asked, well, is there another way that we can do this? Well, yeah, we can make that available outside of, outside of mass if people want to do that. And so it's trying to find that balance of what is the church desire for us in the liturgy? And then also, um, what does this actually mean when we do it? You're, you're pretty great. You're really good at answering these things. I kind of like it better when we've got like Father Brockmeyer, or Father Dufresne on, and they start squirming a little bit when I ask these questions, but I like your answers too. They're really, really good. Compliment me more, Jeff, please. I'm just, all right, I'm just saying. You look great. <laughs> um, here's my follow-up to that. When you are, uh, well, I was going to make a joke and be like, is this why I always see you invite people to stand around the altar with you when you consecrate? But I will have your, you know, when I was in food. middle school, <laughs> when I was in middle school, I went to my, my parish's life teen mass and they invited all the teenagers up to around the altar to hold hands with the priest during the Our Father. And I never went back to that. And I was 13 years old and I didn't know anything about liturgy. I just didn't like that at all. I just say publicly that Life Teen has changed that and they do not do that anymore. I actually just okay. read an article about that the other day. This was 25 years ago. Yes, so yes. yeah, Life Teen is a great organization. So, um, yeah. but uh, no, what I was going to say is priests have a lot of authority in like, you could say power in certain situations, but I've always felt like, the same uh or the most of that like the most authority and power like the most power you have over a crowd is when the sign of peace gets out of hand and you just get to really loudly go lamb of god and just shut everybody down real fast and is that cool when you get to do that and you just watch everybody just immediately buckle down and come right back together and well i will say this i was a middle school teacher before i became a priest and that was one, you know, you just start talking. And I you know I learned very early, never raise your voice, just start talking and they'll come back to you. Yeah. It's when you raise your voice or do something demonstrative that they're really going to take advantage of you because now they see that it bothers you. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I've never, I, I I've never that. responded that I've never done, I've never just like shouted lamb of God or when it gets out of control, I might give a wink and a nod to the, uh, the organist or the pianist uh, let's get this party going but uh <laughs> i've never just shouted out lamb of god q yes just yeah that's... all right that's all i got <laughs> i'm i still keep giggling because i have gallon of syrup written on my <laughs> notes here with a question mark but... all right father thank you for uh joining us today this has been the best podcast we've done this week absolutely yeah <laughs> <laughs> always a pleasure guys Thanks, Father.